Great job, you guys. I like those boots, man. It's hard having good taste. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to Woodlawn, everyone. Good to have you with us. Good to see you. See some new faces, some friendly faces, some uh, and everybody else, you know. So uh, it's, not, it's nice to see you guys. Um, I want to tell you a story. It was 1940, okay, in Amsterdam. There was a man, he was a watchmaker, a uh, Dutch watchmaker, and uh, the Nazis have moved into the Netherlands, and he desires to try and help his neighbors. So while everybody else is scattering and moving out, uh, this man does what he can to take food that he had stored up and make sure that his neighbors are fed. And little by little, they try to help out. Some of the folks who were displaced from their houses come in and start living in the, in the watch store where he sells these Dutch-made watches. Um, he had a daughter named Corrine, and Corrine uh, stood and watched as her dad took care of people. Uh, she had gone through a failed relationship. She had had the death of a younger sibling, and so she's back living with her dad now as an adult. And in 1940, in Europe, there were some things going on, right? We have lots of stuff going on with the Second World War. As the Nazis came into the Netherlands, this family kind of stood tried and true of trying to be faithful to the, to the Lord and to be faithful to his calling in their life. Uh, every day they had a challenge. The challenge was, are they going to look the other way and just join up with the Nazi perspective or, and, and by doing so, save their own lives and, and get rid of their own risk, or are they going to in some way stand against the Nazi forces. Now, they were not warriors. They were not battle ready. They were not going to stand against in a, in a, in a formal, physical way. Uh, but this family had some decisions to make about how they might try and do something good in the midst of this very, very bad moment. And so little by little, what Corrine decided to do uh, was that she decided to help people that would be targeted by the Nazis. Uh, she helped people who dealt with mental illness, uh, those who were struggling with physical ailments. She dealt with helping those who were Jewish because of the fact that obviously they were being targeted. And later in the day, I'm going to tell you a little bit more about Miss Corrine. But the, the idea here is this. She was put in a situation where the ethical issue for her was, is telling the truth and getting people killed the right thing to do, or is telling a lie and saving people's lives the right thing to do? And that is the challenge that our anti-hero that we're going to read about in the scriptures dealt with specifically as well today. Uh, it's good to have you with us here at Woodlawn. Let's pray and we'll get started with the day. Lord, we trust you and we need you. Lord, I ask that you would help today as I communicate the story uh, that's in your word, uh, a beautiful story, a story that doesn't probably get anywhere near as much press as it should. Uh, I pray that I would do a good job of sharing the story today. Lord, I also ask that our ears would be wide open. The truth is, Lord, I don't have much to say, but you have lots to say. And so, I, Lord, our hope and desire is that our ears would be open far beyond listening to what Pastor Brad says, but that our ears would be open to hear what your spirit says to us today. That you would empower us, that you would strengthen us, that you would give us the right outlook on life, that you would show us the right choices to make, the right relationships to have, and the right ways to progress. Lord, we trust you. And in all things, uh, we look forward to all that you're going to do in our lives, Lord. In your name we pray. Amen. The anti-hero today is a woman named Rahab. Now, Rahab's a very interesting character. Some things, for instance, that you might not know. Rahab ends up being King David's great-grandmother. Rahab ends up being in the lineage of Jesus in the book of Matthew. The other thing you need to understand is that Rahab called in the 11th chapter of Hebrews a hero of our faith was a prostitute. That's Rahab's story. 
Today, what you're going to see is the interaction in a world where Rahab is in a tough place. She has a hard decision to make. She's challenged by both good and evil. She lives in a place that is well known for the evil there. She sees an opportunity to escape, but also take her family and her loved ones with her. And she ultimately sees an opportunity to basically make a choice that puts her on the right side of what is right. Um, And it's a really great story. It starts out in the book of Joshua. If you've got your Bibles, you want to open up to chapter 1 of Joshua. I want to give you a little background on on Joshua. Um, Just an interesting thought here. Uh, Joshua is the Hebrew word Yeshua. Okay? Sounds like Joshua, doesn't it? When you translate Yeshua into Greek, you get Iesus. Iesus is the name by which Jesus went. But historically, it's the same name as Joshua. Uh, I once was, uh, we had a young man that lived with us, 79, for a little while, and his name was Joshua. And if you called him Josh, it would bother him. He was like, no, my name's not Josh. My name's Joshua. And I would say, what's the difference? And he says, a Josh is a joke, but Joshua is the name of our Lord and Savior. And I'm like, all right, I will not call you Josh anymore. That's, that's pretty solid. I, I think his mama had driven that into his mind from early age. I'm like, all right, I, I'm willing to go with that. This Joshua uh, that wrote the book of Joshua is from the Old Testament. Uh, he is one of the followers of Moses who was being helped to lead them out of the promised land. Moses dies, as I'm about to read to you, and God puts Joshua in charge of the very final steps of taking the people of God into the promised land. Now, if you will, allow your imagination just for a moment to think about what it's got to feel like as an Israelite right now. You've spent 40 years in the desert. 40 years ago, your ancestors, quite possibly your parents, maybe your grandparents, came out of Egypt and you've heard the story of the greatness of God. How if God's people are on this side of the river and God wants them on that side of the river, God can part the waters and move them across. And not only that, if the enemies of God are coming after his people, God can crash that water back in and destroy that army. That's the God that we serve. That's the God. And yet, for the last 40 years, we've been wandering around in this patch of woods, in this desert, in all these areas. We've been eating food from the sky. We've been following pillars of fire. Like this has been, it just feels like life has not been the same as the promises that we've heard of times past. But things are about to change. Joshua is going to be called by God to lead his people into the final steps of moving into the promised land. And they are going to be helped in a great way by a lady named Rahab. Let's read this together. The scripture says in Joshua 1, 6, After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord... The Lord said to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' assistant, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now therefore, arise, go over the Jordan, that's the river, you and all this people into the land that I am giving to them, to the people of Israel. Verse 3, every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given to you. If you can walk there, it is yours. That's what he's saying, okay? Okay. Just as I promised to Moses, from the wilderness and, uh, and, and this Lebanon as far as the great river, the river Euphrates and the land of the Hittites to the great sea toward the going down of the sun shall be your territory. The sun rises in the east, sets in the west, so he's sending them all the way to the ocean. Next verse. No man shall be able to stand before you, uh, before you all the days of your life. Just as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not leave you nor forsake you. Be strong and courageous, for you shall cause the people to inherit the land that I swore to their fathers to give them. Now, here's what happens. They send in spies to look over the place and recognize what's going on. They come to a city called Jericho. Now, Jericho, historically, is one of the oldest cities recorded on the planet Earth. This is an extremely old city. One of the reasons why the city had remained uh, thriving and around was their system of defense. They had the coolest set of walls you can imagine. In fact, 
The walls of Jericho are believed to have been 23 feet high, and this is the really cool thing. It was a double wall system. Have you ever driven by, uh, say, the state, the state penitentiary or maybe the federal penitentiary near Marion, Illinois, and you notice that they have a fence, but then about 20 feet in, they have another fence, and then about 20 feet in, they have another fence, which means if you're, uh, if you're a federal inmate outside of Marion, Illinois, and you manage to cut through the first fence, guess where you're at? You're now in between two fences. And you manage to cut through the second fence, guess where you are? Now you're once again in between two fences. That is exactly the way the walls of Jericho were built. If an enemy were able to scale the first wall to get over the top and climb down, what they found themselves in was basically a dry moat where now the archers and those hurling large rocks or whatever else they wanted to throw from inside the city itself had you trapped. You could no longer retreat. They had you right where they wanted you. So the trick was to let you get beyond the first wall, let you think that you're being successful, and then destroy you and bury the bodies out back. That's ultimately the way that those in Jericho Fought. It's why also, if those of you who've studied the Bible a little bit, or maybe you sang a song when you were in elementary school, Joshua fit the battle of Jericho, and you know that the walls come crumbling down. That's what has to happen, because you can't simply defeat Jericho by going over or around the walls. In order to win this battle, the walls must fall. Okay? Now, there's a little background here. Rahab, this is culturally what we think is happening here. Rahab runs a bed and breakfast. That's basically the way to describe it. And sometimes in that culture and in that time, with a little extra cash, they put a little more emphasis on the bed part of the bed and breakfast. Okay? That is why not only the Bible, but lots of other places refer to her as a woman of ill repute. Okay? That's a term that's that's intended. That is how Rahab makes her living. That is how Rahab does this. Her facility, like her uh, house, seems to be built into the wall of Jericho itself. It's literally part of the wall because ultimately when she allows these spies to get away in a minute, she lets them down the window outside of her wall and they end up on the outside wall and ultimately are able to get away, okay? This is the story of Rahab. The spies move into Jericho, They go there secretly, quietly, trying to just show up as a few guys moving through town. They get a room in her establishment. That's where they're going to stay. Apparently, some other men who were also in that establishment recognize them as Israelites because someone runs to the king of Jericho and says, there are Israelites, Israelite men here in your city right now. I think they're scoping it out. They're about to attack us. You need to handle this. Okay, that's ultimately what's happening in this story. Uh, And and then eventually this is what happens. Let Let me read to you Joshua 1, 6 and following. I'm sorry, I just read that. This is the story of Rahab. Let me... Rahab learns, I'm sorry you guys, I got myself off by looking at the wrong slide. It's my my fault. Uh, Ultimately what happens is that Rahab learns this story. She can play it safe and she can side with evil or she can risk everything and trust in the character and the promises and the actions of God. Because now what has happened is that the king has sent men to her to say, where are these Israelite men that were staying in your house? Turn them into us, tell, the, tell us where they are so that we may arrest them and kill them. And she has to make the decision either to comply and tell the evil king and his evil men the truth about the godly men she's hiding, or she can lie. And in lying, save their lives and hopefully become a part of what God is doing in this moment. That's the challenge that she has. So today's about ethics in some ways. She has to decide, am I going to play it safe and side with evil? Or am I going to risk everything and trust in the character, the promises, and the actions of God? That's her thing. And that brings us to this question. What about us? Isn't it so much easier to just like look the other way at times and just like not notice what's happening? There's something bad around you. There's something evil going on. There's something harmful. It's so easy and so many of us do it. And a lot of times I think what happens is that we we turn our eye away from it, not even because we recognize it and we choose not to get involved, but oftentimes out of our busyness and our focus, uh, oftentimes we just don't see it. Even though it's right, it's right there, right? 
Well, this is a moment where she doesn't have a choice not to see it. She sees what's happening. She's caught right in the middle and she's got to decide what to do next. Joshua chapter two. And Joshua, the son of Nun, sent two spies, two men secretly from Shittim as spies saying, go view the land, okay, especially Jericho. And they went and they came into the house of a prostitute whose name was Rahab and they lodged there. And it was told to the king of Jericho, behold, men of Israel have come here tonight to search out the land. That's what's happening. Verse 3, then the king of Jericho sent to Rahab saying, bring out the men who have, who have uh, come to you, who entered your house, for they have come to search out the city or the land. But the woman had taken the two men and hidden them. How is it that we make those kinds of decisions in those kinds of moments? Well, the reality is Rahab's faith in God was stronger than her faith in the walls around her. Her faith in God was stronger than the fear that would have come from defying the king. Her faith in God was stronger than the risk that she was taking. So specifically, I'll say it this way, Rahab's faith in God is stronger than her faith in the walls that are around her. Next verse, verse 25, I believe it is. And in the same way, was not also Rahab the prostitute justified this in the New Testament, here's what we're told about Rahab. Two different things. It's really, really beautiful. James 2, 25 and 26 says, And in the same way was not Rahab, the prostitute, justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out by another way. For as the body apart from the spirit is dead, so also faith apart from works is dead. Let, this is a really confusing and fun text, okay? So let's talk about this. Uh, James here is not saying, I just plucked two verses out of a full chapter, okay? James is not here saying that Rahab gets to go to heaven because she did nice things. That's not what he's saying. Rahab is, he's not saying Rahab just made the right choices in life, and therefore by making the right choices in life, uh, God granted her grace, and she therefore gets to go to heaven. That's not what he's saying at all. What James's argument is as a whole is that if God changes you internally, then you will see changes externally. That, that, that's, his, that's his argument. His argument is not that works save us, but that works are evidence that we have been saved. See the difference? So we don't work for our salvation. We serve and work from our salvation. That, that's the reality here. And Rahab is lifted up by James as an example of that. See what God had already done inside of her? Think about this. What kind of inner strength and inner security and inner focus would a person have to have to be living inside of the most fortified city on the planet and the leader, the king of that city gives you a direct command? In their world, she would have sociologically been very low on the totem pole, so to speak, and she has the courage to defy that that man, and stand with the power of God. I want to just throw this out there for a second. I don't think there's a human being on the planet with that kind of courage apart from the courage of God. I don't think there's a human being on the planet that just in and of themselves has such goodness that they will risk all those things without the strength and power that comes from God driving that force. This is why we have to be reborn internally before we will act reborn externally. In the book of Hebrews chapter 11, this is known as the hall of fame of faith. Uh, this is said of her. But by faith, Rahab the prostitute did not perish with those who were disobedient because she had given a friendly welcome to the spies. There's something God is doing in Rahab's life in the book of Joshua in the Old Testament that shows back up so many times in the New Testament. Uh, this is fantastic. Rahab's name shows up along this list. People like Abraham, Jacob, Moses are listed in Hebrews 11. These are the kinds of people who the writer of Hebrews lays out as examples for our faith. And Rahab makes the list. I love, I love that. I think that's just such a beautiful thing. Let's keep going. Joshua 2, 8 through 13 says this. Before the man lay down, before the men lay down, she came up to them on the roof and she said to them, I know that the Lord has given you this land. 
Now, now, where does that come from? Like, how did she know that? I, I know that the Lord has given you this land. We don't have any record of them telling her that. And even if they had told her, why in the world would she believe two men who are from another tribe of people who live in another world that she doesn't even know? I'm telling you that the Lord has told Rahab this is about to happen. Before the men lay down, she came up to them on the roof and she said to them, I know that the Lord has given you the land and that the fear of you has fallen upon us. In other words, my people are scared to death because of what your people, by the power of your God, can do to us. And that all the inhabitants of the land will melt away before you. That's what she says confidently. We have no chance. I don't want anything to do with fighting against you because the God, your God, my God, she would say, is is guiding this, and we know it's true. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea before you when you came out of Egypt, and what you did to the two kings of the Amorites who were beyond the Jordan, to Siho and Og, whom you devoted to destruction. That's a pretty strong phrase, too, by the way, devoted to destruction. Like, that's fighting till the end. Man, it's over. I love this about Rahab. This is a really good, people could read across this because somebody might go, wait a second, Rahab didn't go to church. Rahab didn't go to church very regularly. What, do you know what Rahab was doing? Rahab, Rahab's making some bad decisions here. Rahab has got some skeletons in the closet. Rahab would not have fit in in my women's Bible study at all. Like Rahab, I'm just not sure about Rahab. Listen to this. As soon as, as we heard it, okay, Joshua says, our hearts melted and there was no spirit left in any man because of you. And she, I'm sorry, she says that to them. And she says, for the Lord your God, he is God in the heavens above and on the earth beneath. We hear Rahab's public profession right there. She has now professed publicly to them faith in the real true one God. And we see God working through and in her in all these moments. Joshua 2, 8 says, Verse 12 says, uh, be, but now then, please swear to me by the Lord, she's still talking, that as I have dealt kindly with you, you also will deal kindly with my father's house and give me a sure sign that you will save alive my father and mother, my brothers and sisters, and all whom belong to them to deliver our lives from death. Can we talk about this for a second? This is an intentional rabbit we're going to chase. We live in a world that needs the gospel. I don't think that's a big statement. I think that's an obvious statement. For the last 30 years or so, American churches have tried to find a way to share the gospel in such a streamlined, efficient process where for many folks, sharing the gospel with their mom or their sister or their neighbor or their child went from, I'm going to tell you about the real Jesus who lives in me. It shifted for many Christians from that to, I'm going to take you to my church, and my church does a really good job of telling the gospel. And I just want to tell you something. A pastor can be the greatest communicator on the planet. Musicians, man, they can know their craft and be all prayed up and lead great worship services. Facilities can be cleaned and spit-shined and, and, and have all the best lighting and all the best things. And still, that environment does not have the kind of influence on your family that you do. That environment doesn't have the kind of influence on your friends like you do. So bring them to that environment. That's great. We're, we're going to continue to create that environment right here. But that doesn't replace the fact that Rahab, speaking to the men of God here, goes, wait a second. We're not just taking me out of here safely. We're taking my mom and dad, my father's household. I want my brothers. I want my sisters. I want their kids. I want all of them going with me. I want all of them going with me. I want all of them safe. I want all of them out of here. I'm taking them with me. You promise me that. That's what she's asking for. 
I don't want them to die. I don't want them to hurt. I don't want them to be punished. I want them, and I'll use a New Testament term, I want them saved from this world. You see, Rahab's faith is not in the men that she's helping, but in the God that they serve. You see a little bit of her making sure she understands their commitment. Because it's not so much them that she's doing this for, it's God who she's doing this for. And for us, I think that's true. You see, let's play with this for a second. I can't tell you the number of times I sat down with someone who was, uh, the term people use is de-churched, like used to go to church, okay? Sitting down, here's what they go, here's what they say. I don't think I've ever had someone go, I was walking with the Lord faithfully, and he failed me. Like, God let me down. Like, I, was, I prayed, and he told me he'd do something, and he didn't, and I just, I no longer trust God because God failed me. That's not the story people tell. The story people tell is this. I was going to church, and I was in this class, and there was this person teaching, and they were great, but then one night I went to a bar, and that guy had too much to drink. And I just couldn't go to church where there's hypocrites. Or, you know, I was going to this thing where I was going to help cook, and I'm a very good cook, and I got there, and somebody else was in charge of cooking, and they didn't let me cook, and I got my feelings hurt, and so I don't want to, I don't want to go back. Or I, I could make this stuff up over and over, but you guys have heard these kinds of stories. Here's what I'm getting at. Rahab could have simply looked at the people in the room with her And her level of faith is going to go way down. But Rahab's faith is not in the people. Rahab's faith is in the the God those people serve. The God those people follow. The God those people are listening to. Can I just tell you this? You know what what really like great, like the world's best churches, you know what they're made up of? People. People. They are. You know what the world's worst churches are made up of? People. You know what the world's like best soccer team's made up of? People. But in that world, the devotion is soccer. Nothing wrong with soccer. Not picking on soccer. What is with this? Hey, Jody, I need one less A. (laughs) Three A's, two A's, it makes a difference. We good now? Yeah, I don't know. I'm not, I'm not the guy to always say the devil's in the technology or something like that, but every now and then there's just a reason why there's lots of things getting in the way. I don't know what that is today, but uh, let me do this. Let's pray together and I'll, I'll get my mind back in the right place. Lord, I trust you and I need you. Uh, help me focus, help me communicate well today. In your name we pray, amen. Once again, her statement is this. And as soon as we heard it, our hearts melted and there was no spirit left in any men because of you. She's talking about the, how scared the people of the city are. She says, for the Lord your God, he is God in the heavens above and on the earth beneath. This is where her faith lies. So I have a question for you. Uh, despite your own past doubts and disobedience, have you confessed your faith to God? Let me just get real serious here. It, it's great like, to find a church, and, and our church is growing, and we're seeing new people real often, and had four new folks join the church last week, and, and it's like lots of good things happening. So it's one thing to go, I love this church, I love, and I want you to love this church, and I hope you love this church, but, but listen, this church in and of itself doesn't get anybody to heaven. This church in and of itself doesn't, doesn't make those things happen. It, it's, it's Christ who does. And so my, my job can't be to make it to where you simply love being a part of this church. Uh, my role and the role of all leaders here has to be that we're helping people know Christ. 
and to not just, not just know about him, not just know things concerning him, but to know him and to put our trust, our faith in him so that no matter what we face and no matter where we're going, he is the one guiding and directing us and we can trust him and we can move forward. So friends, today, if you've not put your faith in Christ, please don't walk out of this room later without it. Even right now, if you would say, Jesus, I trust you, I love you, please save me, please change my life. Get, take this heart of stone and, and make it a heart of flesh. Like, like give me a new heart, Lord. My favorite part of the Rahab story is that when she decides to finally help out these men of God, the spies that had come to town, here's, here's the way she does it. Uh, she tells the king's men to go in one direction, and then she sends them in the other direction. That's basically what she does. And she lets them down the wall outside of a window from her establishment, and they climb down that rope. And now, with her still up in the window and them down on the ground, uh, she says again, I want you to make sure you take care of my people. Um, and and I, I want you to do this. Um, and they said, well, take that red rope, that red cord, and, and, and hang it out of your window. And any warrior coming here will know that that's your place. That red cord is your place. Now, it's just a red rope, y'all. It's, it's, it's just a red strand. It's just a red rope. That's all, all it is. But metaphorically, that red rope has has begun to be thought of as a lot of things uh, uh, for a lot of people. Like, what is it that you trust to hold on to you even when you, when you, are, uh, you, know, when you, when you feel distant? What, what is it that tethers you to the Lord? What is it that keeps you tied to him, keeps you connected to him? I think it's intriguing that it's red. And I know that on the one hand, you probably got red light district kind of thoughts going on there. But the fact that this is a red rope reminds me of the blood of Christ. That, that holds us tight. When someone looks at my life or your life and says, why should they be treated well by God. It's not, it's not, well, look what she does and look what he did. And it's, no, it's, it's look at the blood of Christ on their life. Look at the blood of Christ, the, this red cord that holds us tight to him. We're not told much for the next two chapters in Joshua. So between the time that the spies leave and then the armies of Israel come back. We've got two chapters of Joshua. We're not told much or anything really about Rahab. We don't know what was happening in her mind and in her father's household for those couple of days. It makes me ask this question. Um, did she pace or did she prepare? <laughs> There's a difference, right? Was it, oh my gosh, I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know what's going to happen. Or is it, I know exactly what's going to happen. And I'm, I'm, I'm getting ready for this. Uh, did she doubt or was she devoted to this truth? You see, we, like her, are in a similar place. We're living in a world where we have responded to the power of God. We have professed our faith in him. We have been changed by his grace. And one day, he's coming back for us. One of these days, he, he's coming back for us. Now, it may be that he comes back literally for us in our own lifetimes. That, that could happen in the next five seconds. Or it may be that like so many Christians before, we live out the entirety of our earthly existence, we pass away, and we spend time with him in paradise until the time that he brings us back in his final return with him. Our question for us is often, as we wait for the future that God's going to deliver, will we pace or will we prepare? Will we be nervous and worried and fret? Or will we be focused and understand what it is he's told us to do and live that life regardless of what's going on around us being focused? Are we going to doubt or are we going to be devoted? I, I don't know what Rahab did, but my thoughts are most likely this lady right here she knows what God's going to do. And so she's most likely preparing for that. Joshua 6, 15 says, On the seventh day, they arose early, at the dawn of the day, and they marched around the city in the same manner seven times. It was only on that day that they marched around the city seven times. And the city and all that is within it shall be devoted to the Lord for destruction. Only Rahab the prostitute, and all who are with her in her house shall live because she hid the messengers 
whom we sent. God's faithfulness is greater than any walls of doubt or any disobedience standing in our way. God's faithfulness is greater. Now here's the reality right now. If you're a believer, and if you're awaiting a time like Rahab would have, that the Lord is coming back for you, coming back to get you, you've got a life to live. And you have purpose in that life. So here's what I'm asking you to do. This is not a time to just check out and go, well, I'm saved, and one of these days he's going to take me home. So all that space in between, I'm just going to check out. I'm just going to like cross my fingers and close my eyes and wait till it happens. It's so easy to want to do that because what we're surrounded by is troubling at times. What we see in this world is difficult at times. It would be easy to do that. But we have to remember and know that the faithfulness of God is greater than what we're going to face. And so there's no reason to check out. We should actually be checking in to this life. Live this life and give it purpose and make it matter so that, so that we have the opportunity, like Rahab did, to take our parents and our kids and our siblings and our friends and our neighbors and our coworkers. We want them all to go with us. So what can we do to help make that happen? We trust in God's faithfulness and we, and we live a life that engages the world around us with the gospel. You see, you'd be amazed what one simple act of obedience can do. Let me talk to you about obedience for a second. Most of us were raised, most of our culture was raised in a, in a behave culture. So what that means, when I say the word obedience, your mind automatically goes to things I'm not supposed to do. Like obedience means don't, don't do this, don't do that, don't do that other thing. But for today's sake, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not saying obedience as in make sure that you live a, uh, a spotless, glossy, white, clean life. That's not, well, that, that's not bad advice, but that's not what I'm talking about right now. I'm talking about the, the, the idea of obeying God forward, like seeing someone who needs your help and stepping into it. Seeing someone who needs your focus and giving them that focus. Seeing someone who needs to hear the gospel and sharing it with them. Seeing someone who's hurting and helping them. This is an obedience that's not passive, like, God, I'm just going to try to make sure that I don't swear, right? This is, this is stronger than that. This is, Lord, my life has purpose, and I'm supposed to interact with people every day. And in that interaction, I can make their life better by the power of your spirit through me if I will obey. If I will obey. You'd be amazed what one simple act of obedience. Um, one time I was walking through South Livingston Elementary School. It's the school that Stephanie, one of the schools that Stephanie works with, and it's where our kids went to elementary school. Um, I can't remember exactly why I was there. I think there was some sort of like a science fair. So the kids were preparing a little thing they were going to show people, okay? And I was there with Jackson, actually, who was doing his thing. There was, a, there was a little girl about his age, and she was carrying way too much for one kid to carry. She had her entire presentation, you know, like all of it under both of her arms, and just trying, and she couldn't see. She's walking with stuff in front of her face. And she trips and falls, and, and it spills all over the floor. Now, this is in a very full school. There are people everywhere. So now her stuff's getting stepped on. People are walking around. Um, and I, I just happened to be there. Like, I, 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 I just happened to be there. I just happened to be in the right moment at the right time. I did what I think any parent would do. I got down on my knees and I helped her start picking it up. You know, there's, there's like, there's no great goodness in that. There's just normal, you know, decent behavior, right? I got it all together with her and we picked it all back up and she looked me dead in the eye and she was crying because her mom and dad didn't come to help her do this presentation. There wasn't any, she, there had been no adult involved in anything happening here. And I said, what do you need to do with this stuff? And she said, I need to get it to my room. And so we, we gathered it up, and she and I together, which is how it should have been, an adult and a kid together could carry it all. We took it to her room, and we, and we started to set it up. 
And she looked and she said, her teacher was in there, there was nobody else there, and she's going to do her presentation to an empty room with just a teacher. And she said to me, will you stay and watch? And I said, yeah, yeah, I'll stay and watch. So I stayed and watched. Um, about four years later, I baptized that young lady. Uh, and, her, and her family and, and lots of things happened. And here's what I'm telling you, okay? I didn't walk in that day like, Lord, help me meet someone who needs you today. Like, I, I, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that prayer. I just, I didn't do that, okay? I, didn't, I, I went there to see my own son do a little presentation and then go home. That, like any other parent who wants to be in and out. Like, I like get there, do what I'm supposed to do, go home. That's what I was there to do. But the Lord put something right in front of you and you do it. And I think most anybody in this room would have done exactly what I did. So it's not like a brag thing. Just what I'm telling you is this. It's really easy to check out in life and just kind of like put your earbuds in and look at the floor and get where you're going and do what you're supposed to do and get back in your car and go home. I, I say that because I know that when I was on my knees helping this little girl, there were parents with their own kids everywhere. Everybody doing their own thing, taking care of their own responsibilities, getting their accomplishments done. And it, it doesn't take much for us to just be willing to see the opportunity for one simple act of obedience and how God can use that to change somebody's life. It, it really doesn't, it doesn't take much to just make ourselves more aware of what's happening around us in the same way that Rahab helps these men. Joshua 6, 8. 18 says, but you keep yourselves from the things de devoted to destruction, lest when you have devoted them to, you take any of the devoted things and make the camp of Israel a thing of destruction. In other words, you're leaving this culture, you're leaving this world and you're leaving it behind. Do not bring it with you. Okay. Do not bring it with you. Uh, we don't want to bring trouble into Israel. We're keeping that safe. But all the silver and all the gold and every vessel of bronze and iron are holy to the Lord. They shall go into the treasury of the Lord. So the people shouted and the trumpets were blown. As soon as the people heard and the sound of the trumpet, the people shouted a great shout and the wall fell down flat. So that the people went up into the city, every man straight before him, and they captured the city. can't imagine what that would feel like. I've not been in the military. I've not been in a battle. Um, the thought of praising God and shouting and singing and praying and then seeing literal walls fall down. And as soon as they, the dust settles, they hit the ground, you rush in to town. That's, that sounds both amazing and kind of scary to me. Like that's, it's pretty crazy. Um, I love what happens with Rahab. Even though she's dealing with something very scary, she trusts that the Lord is in it. Even though what she might see seems horrifying, she knows that the, tr the Lord is honorable and she can trust him. And so like her, I would encourage is that when you're afraid, take a step of faith anyway. When you're afraid... Move into the guidance God has given you. When you're afraid, keep going. You see, courage is not the absence of fear. It's not, I'm not scared of anything. It's, that's not, it's not even true, right? Um, courage is when faith connects with fear. And all of a sudden, what looks scary becomes our first step, <laughs> and we just, and we do it. We take our step into the future God has painted for us, given to us. When you're afraid, take a step of faith anyway. And so this week, I encourage you to do this. Make a decision to, set, to make a single step of obedience this week. So each of us right now, if you would, just as we kind of close out here, would you think about what is a simple step of obedience you need to make this week? Maybe it's that phone call that you should have made last week and, and, and you're going to make this week, that person you need to talk to. Maybe it's that relationship that's been kind of on the rocks and you're going to focus some attention on it. 
Maybe it's that sin in your life that needs to be confessed so that you can have some accountability so that you can stop it. Maybe it's that person who's right around you, but you don't see them. For some reason, you're distracted, you're not seeing them. And this week, you need to be intentional about seeing them. Whatever it is, walk away today with this desire. I'm going to look for a simple step of obedience this week, and I'm going to do it. I'm going to look for a simple step of obedience, and I'm going to do it. Would you pray with me? Lord, I trust your voice to speak. Mine was not great today. I caught myself getting distracted and slide in the wrong place and things like that that didn't help. Uh, But Lord, this isn't about what I have to say. It's about what you have to say. And so I ask, Lord, that you would speak to us. I'm so encouraged by the story of Rahab. It shows us, Lord, that no matter where someone comes from, they can come to you. It shows us that our greatest failures do not have to be our defining realities. We can be more than what we have been. Lord, I thank you that in history, Rahab is not known as as just a prostitute. Rahab is known as a woman of faith and a member of the lineage of both King David and King Jesus. Thank you for her example today. May we take it. Eyes open, awareness there, so that we can see those simple steps of obedience and that our faith can move from just an internal thing to an external thing where our faith is actually guiding our works. Lord, we trust you with this. In your name we pray. Amen. Would you stand with me? As we sing and worship the Lord, uh, if you need private time with the Lord, I encourage you to come forward and kneel. If you'd like to pray with somebody, uh, then, then head to the back room and there'll be somebody there to pray with you. Let's worship him.